Spinal anesthesia is a procedure where a local anesthetic is injected into the fluid surrounding the spinal cord to temporarily block pain signals from the lower body, making it ideal for procedures on the hips, legs, or lower abdomen. It falls under the category of regional anesthesia, neuraxial in particular. It is also called intrathecal injection or subarachnoid block. The history of spinal anesthesia began with J. Leonard Corning in 1885, who first performed an intrathecal injection of cocaine in a dog and later a human, though the latter was not a successful surgical anesthesia. The first successful spinal anesthesia for surgical purposes was performed by August Beer in Germany in 1898, who injected cocaine into the subarachnoid space of his assistant. Over time, the technique evolved with the development of safer and more effective anesthetic agents, improved aseptic techniques, and better spinal needle designs. Spinal anesthesia is ideally indicated for surgical procedures located below the umbilicus. This includes lower abdominal surgeries like hernia repairs and appendectomies, as well as pelvic procedures such as hysterectomies and urological operations. It is also the preferred technique for lower limb orthopedic surgery, including hip and knee replacements, and is extensively used for cesarean sections in obstetric patients. A key reason for its use in these cases is the significant advantages it provides over general anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia produces excellent operative conditions with profound muscle relaxation and analgesia while avoiding the pulmonary risks associated with positive pressure ventilation and airway manipulation. The technique provides superior postoperative pain control that extends for hours after surgery, significantly reducing the need for systemic opioids and their associated side effects. Spinal anesthesia also reduces surgical blood loss through sympathetic blockade and lowers thrombotic risk by increasing blood flow in the lower extremities. However, it is crucial to know the contraindications, which we divide into absolute and relative. Absolute contraindications are situations where spinal anesthesia should not be performed under any circumstances, including patient refusal, infection at the puncture site because it risks introducing pathogens into the central nervous system, and severe uncorrected hypovolemia or shock since the sympathetic blockade can cause catastrophic hypotension. Furthermore, True allergy to local anesthetic agents risks anaphylaxis, significantly increased intracranial pressure risks life-threatening brainstem herniation, and critical coagulopathy or therapeutic anticoagulation carries a high risk of spinal epidural hematoma. Relative contraindications require careful risk-benefit analysis and include pre-existing neurological disease because the block may be wrongly blamed for disease progression, fixed cardiac output states such as severe aortic stenosis since these patients cannot compensate for the hemodynamic shifts, and sepsis away from the puncture site due to the theoretical risk of CNS seeding. Significant spinal deformities are also a relative contraindication as they make the procedure technically challenging and can lead to unpredictable anesthetic spread, and a planned surgical duration that exceeds the drug's efficacy is a practical concern for the anesthesia wearing off prematurely. Spinal anesthesia relies on precise anatomical knowledge to safely inject local anesthetic into the subarachnoid space. The vertebral column forms the bony framework that protects the spinal cord and provides the reference points for needle insertion. It consists of 33 vertebrae divided into 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 fused sacral, and 4 fused coccygeal bones. Each vertebra consists of a vertebral body anteriorly and a vertebral arch posteriorly, enclosing the vertebral foramen. The succession of these foramina forms the vertebral canal, which contains the spinal cord, meninges, and cerebrospinal fluid. The spinal cord itself extends from the foramen magnum, where it continues from the brainstem, to approximately the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra in adults, forming the conus medullaris and continues as the phylum terminale. Below the conus medullaris, 
the lumbar and sacral nerve roots descend within the dural sac as the cauda equina, floating freely in cerebrospinal fluid. Because the spinal cord terminates at this level, spinal anesthesia is performed below L2, most commonly at the L3, L4 or L4, L5 interspaces, to avoid the risk of cord injury. In pediatric patients, the spinal cord extends to a lower level, reaching approximately the lower border of the third lumbar vertebra at birth. As the child grows, the vertebral column elongates more rapidly than the spinal cord, and by adolescence, the termination ascends to the adult level at L1, L2. For this reason, spinal anesthesia in infants and young children is performed at lower levels, typically at the L4, L5 or L5S1 interspace, to prevent cord injury. It is also therefore important to know about surface anatomy to locate the correct landmarks. The spinous processes can be felt along the back and help to identify the midline. In the cervical region, the most prominent spinous process is that of the seventh cervical vertebra. In the thoracic region, the spinous process of the seventh thoracic vertebra lies at the level of the inferior angle of the scapula. The line joining the highest points of the iliac crests, known as Tuffier's line, corresponds to the body of the fourth lumbar vertebra or the space between the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. Dermatomal levels provide valuable surface guides for assessing the level and extent of sensory block. Specific anatomical landmarks correspond to particular dermatomes, with the nipples aligning with T4, the xiphoid process with T6, the umbilicus with T10, and the inguinal region with T12 to L1. By evaluating sensation at these landmarks, we can accurately determine the height and distribution of the sensory block. The vertebral column consists of several layers arranged from back to front. These are the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, epidural space, dura matter, arachnoid matter, and finally the subarachnoid space which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. The needle must pass through all these layers to reach the cerebrospinal fluid. An important surface landmark used to guide safe needle insertion is Tuffier's line, which corresponds approximately to the level of the fourth lumbar vertebra.